Uh, I guess we should get started. Um, there seems to be a little bit of confusion about the rooms. Uh, this is the Padang room. This is the IRTF open meeting. If you're looking for the Collier room, you should be next door. OK, so this is the, the IRTF open meeting. Uh, my name is Colin Perkins. I'm the, the IRTF chair. Um, there should be blue sheets uh, circulating shortly. Please uh, make sure you sign in. Um, a reminder that uh, the, the usual uh, IRTF um, intellectual property disclosure rules apply to this meeting. Um, you know, as with the IETF sessions, if you, ha if you know of IPR related to the, uh, to the discussion, uh, when, when you're making a contribution, you need to disclose that. Uh, in addition, uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, uh, this meeting will be being recorded uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the recording will be made public. Um, and that uh, we have a code of conduct, uh, and um, please uh, you know, uh, work, work respectfully with others uh, when, when participating in the IRTF. Um, also, uh, I'd like to remind you that this is an IRTF, an Internet Research Task Force session. Um, and a reminder that the IRTF is uh, focused on longer term research issues, and we'll discuss more of this uh, later in the session. Uh, but uh, unlike the IETF sessions which are happening this week, uh, this is a research group. Uh, it is not a standards development organization. We are, we are doing research here rather than standards. Uh, and if, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the difference between the IRTF and the IETF, uh, then RFC 7418 uh, is a really nice primer for uh, n new, I new participants in the IRTF who have been used to the IETF process. We have uh, a number of ways in which you could keep yourself informed about the IRTF. Um, we've got the uh, IRTF.org webpage, uh, which lists information about, about all the research groups, uh, about all the other activities we do here. Um, we have um, Facebook and Twitter accounts. Uh, the, the Twitter account is perhaps uh, more active than the Facebook page, but uh, we have them. And feel free to follow us on social media, if that's your thing. Uh, we also have mailing lists uh, for those who like things more old school, and pl please subscribe to the lists. So the IRTF is comprised of a number of research groups. Right? Uh, we have 14 research groups in the IRTF, um, of which 13 of them are, are meeting this week. Um, the, the DIN RG group is not meeting, the Decentralized Infrastructure Group, but all the rest are meeting. Uh, of these, two of them, the Computation in the Network group and the Quantum Internet group, are, are proposed research groups. Um, new groups get a year to uh, act, as, act as if they are a research group, and then we, they, they go for a review, and we, we decide if they should be made uh, permanent full research groups. The, the Computation in the Network group uh, will be having that, that, that review this week. Uh, uh, the, the Quantum Internet group will be doing that at the next meeting. All the rest uh, are, are full, full research groups, uh, and the majority of them have still to meet, so uh, look out for them on the agenda, and uh, please do consider participating. In addition to the research groups, we run two other activities in the IRTF. Those of you who were at the meeting in Montreal earlier in the year would have seen the Applied Networking Research Workshop for 2019 running in parallel with, with the, uh, the meeting in Montreal. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that the 2020 Applied Networking Research Workshop will uh, co-locate with the ITF in Madrid next summer. Uh, that workshop will be chaired by Miria and Roland, uh, who m many of you will know. Uh, look out for the call for papers for that uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I expect the paper submission deadline will be in the sort of March-April time frame, um, and the proceedings will be published uh, in the ACM Digital Library. This is all done in, in conjunction with ACM SIGCOM. The other activity we, we have is the Applied Networking Research Prize. This is a prize awarded for recent results in applied networking research, which may be uh, relevant to transitioning into internet products, related standards, and the IRTF and the IETF. 
We've got one uh, ANRP uh, prize-winning talk, which will be happening just, just after I finish these introductory remarks uh, by uh, Weiting Cheng, uh, who'll be talking about uh, off-path off TCP exploits um, and how uh, wireless, wireless routers can jeopardize your secrets. Um, we also have the nominations for the 2020 Applied Networking Research Prizes, uh, which, which are now open. Um, if you go to the uh, irtf.org slash ANRP website, um, if you've read any good uh, papers on applied networking research, anything which you think would be deserving of a prize um, to, to bring, the author, bring the author to the IRTF and the IATF for a week, then please uh, consider nominating that work. Right? The, the deadline for nominations is at the end of this week. Um, but and, you know, we're, we're always looking for, for, for good, good, good nominations, good work to, uh, to potentially award the prize to. Uh, we typically award two prizes p for, for each of the uh, IETF meetings, so, so we're looking for s six good papers uh, to make the awards to. Um, we had hoped to have two, two prize-winning prize talks today. Uh, the, the other speaker, uh, the other awardee, um, had uh, f family issues, which meant that she couldn't attend this meeting, so we'll be postponing that talk, and we'll be doing it at one of the later meetings instead. So that's about all I have to say. Um, the agenda for today, um, the first thing we have up is uh, Wei Teng uh, with his uh, ANRP prize winning talk, uh, as I say, on off path TCP exploits. Following that, we've got a, a brief update on the computation in, in the network research group, um, which, uh, as, as I say, is finishing its uh, third meeting uh, and, and will be up for to transitioning from proposed research group to full research group uh, after this, this week. And then we've got some discussion. Um, we've got a, um, a little bit of discussion from uh, uh, Melinda will be leading, uh, talking about the relation between the IRTF and the IETF. Um, Aaron and Laurent will be leading some discussion about moving work from the research world into the, uh, the standards world. And we'll be finishing up with uh, some discussion about how the IETF can help, uh, sorry, how the IRTF, sorry if you ex excuse the typo there, can help academia and, and vice versa. So, with that, uh, I guess we should move on to the prize-winning talk, uh, waiting. Come on up. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and thank you for coming for my talk. Oh, okay, sure. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to share a new side channel we discovered in old generations of wireless technology and how we can exploit it to perform off-path TCP injection attacks. Uh, this is basically a cross-layer attack in which a design choice of wireless protocol can actually compromise the security at application layer. So what's the, uh, what's, what is the off-path TCP injection attack? Here's the thread model we used in our work. Um, for now, I, uh, the router is not involved in this thread model, but I will get into that later. Typically, given two host, one client, and one target server, Mallory is able to inject spoof data into the wicketing connection between the client and the server. The attack is performed in the following steps. First, Mallory can lure the wicketing into visiting the malicious website, for example, via phishing email. And then, when the wicketing clicks on the uh, link given in the phishing email and visit the malicious website, a JavaScript will run on the client machine, which can initiate two connections, one to the target server and uh, the other one to the off path attacker. Since these two connections are under our control, we can send arbitrary numbers of requests to the target server um, so that the connection between the client and the server can be kept alive for a long time. 
as long as we keep sending requests to the server. As opposed to man-in-the-middle attacks where the attacker can intercept the response and temper the content, Mallory is completely off-pass and can now eavesdrop any of this traffic. Mallory, however, can send spoofed packets with server's IP address to pretend to be the server. Of course, the client will validate every incoming packet based on some secret shared between the client and the server. Uh, the secret is created when the connection is established. Uh, because of the secret, it's really difficult for the attacker, for the uh, off-pass attacker, to send spoof packets with the correct secret if we just do random guess. Therefore, the draw script running on the client machine is also for the purpose of sending some feedback, informing the attacker whether his guessing is correct or not. Since the draw script has no privilege, it cannot peer into the victim connection and steal the secret. Instead, we rely on some side channel to infer the behaviors of how the client responds to those spoofed packets. And then based on the uh, feedbacks, the attacker can guess multiple rooms and finally figure out what's the correct secret. You may wonder uh, what's the impact of this thread model because even though we can inject spoof data into the victim connection, the whole procedure is performed on the malicious website and uh, the attacker can already control the whole page. Why would we bother to do this? Well, um, the trick here is that once the spoof data is accepted by the client, it will be cached in the browser for a long time. So you can imagine that next time when the user, when the victim tries to access the same server, the browser will actually reload this uh, injected page rather than sending a new request to the server. And even worse, if the user does not clear the cache manually, it can be uh, cached in your browser for years. Here, uh, supposed to be a video demo, but unfortunately we cannot do that, so I just took some snapshots to give you some flavor of how it looks like. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when the victim tries to access uh, the malicious website, there are actually two connections underneath. One connects to the target server, in this case it's the CNN News website, and uh, the other one connects to the uh, off-pass attacker launching the, the real attack. Once the, uh, once the attack succeeds, the injected page will be cached in the browser. And when the user tries to access the homepage of CNN News, he or she will actually see this page showing up. As we can see, there is an injected login component at the top. This is, only, uh, this is uh, uh, one version of the attack. Uh, we performed for Windows. There is actually another version for Mac OS. You can uh, find these two videos through the link given in our paper. So what's the secret I'm talking about? Um, in order to successfully inject spoof data into the victim connection, we need to know how TCP stack validates an incoming packet. Here's the uh, simplified TCP specification. Um, the secret I'm talking about is actually the three tuple, including port number, sequence number, and acknowledgement number. So uh, let's take a close look at the sequence number check. As we can see here, uh, when the packet contains an out of window sequence number, the client will actually send a, resp a response back to the server. In the other case where the sequence number is in window but uh, the acknowledgement number is out of window, the packet will be silently dropped. So we can see here there is, uh, the client will actually behave differently depending on whether the sequence number is in window or not, right? Um, I actually have a question about this and I got this question a lot but I don't have a perfect answer for this. So basically the question is that why the client should send a response back to the packet even if the packet contains an out of window sequence number? Does anyone in this room know the answer or any reasoning for this? Because it sounds weird if you know that the packet is broken uh, in terms of regarding the sequence number, why we should send a response back, right? 
Yeah, that's a question we can discuss later. Let's move on. So there are actually uh, several um, side channels against the TCP connections. I'm not going to dig into the details, but I, want, I just want to summarize. The first two set of, uh, side channels have been fixed already. The third one requires a malware running on the client machine to monitor the system. In our work, we discovered a new side channel that is inherent in all generations of wireless technology. And uh, the off-pass attack we, uh, we present in our work only requires a JavaScript running on the client machine. And all three major operating systems are affected by the attack. It's also worth noting that our attack is the only working one without any mitigation in place. And it's practically infeasible to fix it. So from a high level view of the side channel attacks against TCP connection that are discovered in prior work, all of them manifest themselves through the following control flow block. There are actually two essential building blocks. First, anytime you have a side channel, there must be some global resource shared between the attacker and victim. In the context of TCP side channels, depending on whether the sequence number is in window or not, the shared state may change accordingly. Secondly, and most importantly, the shared state change must be observable to the attacker. So what's the um, shared resource we discovered in a router? Well, um, the insight is that the half-duplex nature of wireless creates a shared resource between uplink and downlink traffic. Half duplex is in contrast to full duplex. Full duplex means that both uplink and downlink traffic can transmit at the same time, while full, uh, half duplex only allows one direction to transmit at a time. For wireless networks, it makes perfect sense to use half duplex because if both ends try to transmit at the same frequency and at the same time, it's likely to cause interference, back off, and then retransmission. Since half duplex is a fundamental design choice of wireless protocol, it's really difficult to change. Let's consider the following two scenarios in wireless. Um, let's consider, assume that uh, the client has established two connections, one to the target server and the other one to the outpass attacker. In this case, the outpass attacker can send both legitimate and spoof packets to the client. Because, um, because wireless is half duplex, when both uplink and downlink traffic are transmitting at the same time, it's likely to cause interference, which enforces either or both ends to back off and then retransmit. Suppose the client gets the chance to transmit, then the spoofed packet has to wait to be sent later. So does the third packet. As we can see here, the round trip time of the post probe query now is prolonged due to this particular spoofed packet. Let's consider a similar scenario. Compared to the previous one, it's almost the same, except that now the spoofed packet can trigger a response. Recall that when the packet contains an out of window sequence number, the client should send a response back, right? But the, uh, the issue here is that the packet is sent back to the server. So how, the, how does the attacker can see this, can see the difference? Well, because of this additional response triggered by the spoofed packet, the, third, the packet, now the post pop query, now experiences more contention, increasing its round trip time. Let's put them together. As we can see, there is a timing difference of the round trip times for the post pop query in these two scenarios. Uh, therefore, uh, based on the uh, round trip times, the attacker can determine whether the spoofed packet has triggered a response or not, which in turn tells whether the spoofed packet contains a correct sequence number or not. However, um, you may wonder that the uh, 
the timing difference resulted from this additional response is too small to be measurable. Well, that's true. Um, but what if we can amplify the signal? So in this figure, we also illustrate the uh, amplifiable nature of the side channel. In this case, the attacker can send two probing uh, spoofed packets to the client, causing more contention, which delays the third post probe query even, even further, which means the more probing packets we send, the more contention we experience, and therefore we can observe larger round trip times. I also want to mention that um, this is not exactly what happens in reality, because reality is more complex than this, but I hope it can offer a concrete example to show the timing difference. So far, we only uh, discussed, uh, conceptually discussed the timing side channel and its effect. Now I want to show some empirical test results to understand the real world implication. We created a total of 16 different setups to make sure that the timing difference, the timing side channel exists in various products. We used four different wireless routers and two different machines of, as the client. We also varied the frequency of each router. So uh, follow the same probing strategy I mentioned earlier. We measure the round trip times of the post probe query with 100 runs. We picked three representative test results here. As we can see, the timing difference is clear and measurable. On average, it's about two milliseconds. And also, the timing difference grows as we increment the number of probing packets we send per test. We also measure the round trip times at two different locations where, where the attacker is far away from the victim with round trip times over 20 milliseconds. Although there um, is more overlapping between those boxes, the timing difference is still clearly present and measurable. So back to the um, TCP off-pass attack where we want to infer the secrets, uh, secret. Let's start with the port number inference. Since the client will behave differently depending on whether the sequence number, whether the port number is correct or not, the attacker can actually send multiple spoofed probing packets with a guessed source port number to the client, and then determine whether his guessing is correct or not by simply exploiting the time inside channel. Uh, now that we know the port number, we can further infer the sequence number. Compared to the uh, port number inference, it's almost the same. We can still apply the guess then check scheme to infer the sequence number. However, the issue here is that it's unclear whether all the operating systems will behave the same as we il illustrated here. So we um, survey the lat uh, latest Linux and the Mac OS by inspecting their kernel source code and uh, developed a test program to measure the behaviors of Windows. This table shows the behaviors of different operating systems when processing 10 identical packets. As we can see here, the three operating systems behave consistently on sequence number check, which means that we can always apply the guess and check scheme to infer the sequence number. Uh, there's one interesting fact of uh, about the behaviors of uh, Windows. Uh, in, I, did, I didn't show the, uh, show the number in this table. You can find the complete table in our, in our paper. So the, the, the fact is that we found that when the, so normally in the RFC draft, we, it says that the client should send a response back when the packet contains an out of window sequence number, right? But we, um, I'm sorry, so in the RFC draft, it says that we should accept any sequence number in the window, right? But we found that in Windows, if the connection is idle, then it only accepts the sequence number that exactly equal to the next expected sequence number. And uh, this behavior is never, I guess, never specified in any RFC standards, so I don't know why Windows 
have implemented in this way. So if anyone from Microsoft knowing <laughs> the answer for this, I will appreciate the answer. Okay, let's continue. Um, the implementation for acknowledgement number check actually varies significantly from one OS to another. So we propose customized strategies for each operating system by exploiting the HTTP specification and the behaviors of browsers. Remember that our ultimate goal is to perform of pass TCP injection attacks. We don't actually need to know the exact act number to perform the attack. Therefore, we can just brute force every possible act number. And uh, uh, even though we can still exploit the time inside channel to infer the act number, the brute forcing strategy is more efficient, only taking a couple of seconds as there is no, uh, no waiting for check. So we uh, implemented a complete attack for each operating system. The test results are shown in the up table regarding the success rate and average time cost. We also, to further demonstrate that this attack is practical, we also report the result under a remote attacker scenario where the attacker is far away from the victim with round trip times over 20 milliseconds. So how serious is the time inside channel? After we discovered this issue, we reached out to um, discuss this uh, vulnerability with IEEE L2.11 working group. But unfortunately, we all agree that this is almost impossible to be fixed at physical and Mac layers. That being said, we still need to discuss some possible defenses and mitigations. Um, one straightforward idea is to make wireless uh, photo plaques. Although research has been done on this area, uh, we are still facing some real world challenges which need to be carefully addressed and it's unclear when the technology will be widely deployed in practice. Since our attack also exploit the TCP specification, making TCP stack behave consistently, uh, regardless of the sequence and acknowledgement number, would be a good defense. One possible um, strategy to consider is to really limit responses for incoming packets with out-of-window sequence number so that the attacker can no longer amplify the signal by simply sending multiple spoofed probing packets. Uh, lastly, um, in application layer, using HTTPS instead of HTTP can prevent the attack, even though it does not eliminate the root cause of the side channel. And I also want to emphasize that deploying HTTPS is not enough if HTTP strict transport security security is absent. One representative example is the CN News website I showed earlier in the demo. You can see that um, CN News website does use HTTPS, but we can still make the attack succeed, right? The theme here is that when the user tries to access the homepage of CN News website, the initial request was submitted over HTTP and then it's the server that subsequently redirects the browser to its HTTPS set. Therefore, the attacker can simply inject a spoofed uh, page, inject a, a fake page for the initial request. So uh, my point here is that even though uh, you have deployed HTTPS, if you do not enforce it, then it's useless. To conclude, we found a new time inside channel that is inherent in all generations of various technology, and we show that the time inside channel is reliable and amplifiable, and it's almost impossible to fix it without substantial change to the wireless specification. We also show that the time inside channel affects Windows, Mac OS, and Linux by starting their TCP stack implementation and conducting real-world attacks against them. We also stressed uh, some possible defenses to alleviate this issue. The source code of the attack is publicly available online, so if you are interested, you should check it out. Um, that's all for my presentation. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. First of all, thank you very much. <laughs> so if 
Hi, uh, this is Daniel Con Gilmore from the ACLU. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for this work. This is really great stuff, uh, and it's a good reminder to all of us that timing side channels can be uh, stepping stones towards mm -hmm. uh, towards other problems. Yeah. Uh, so I really appreciate the way that you've connected all the dots here and shown that this can be done. I was curious about uh, your proposed mitigations, whether you've had a chance to test any of them in the same environments that you tested the um, the exploit itself. So in particular. I'm thinking about the mitigations that can be done uh, at the TCP layer itself, um, right? The, the middle mitigation that you described there, if you had a chance to test uh, like modifying the kernel or something like that to see whether it would affect the results that you, um, that you got for the other attack. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Actually, we, um, so if you look at the source code for Linux kernel, it actually have implemented some mechanism like this to read limit uh, responses for incoming packets. But we found that it's actually only read limit for, um, for the incoming packets that has no payload. So I'm not sure why they're doing this, but so you can see that you can actually bypass this uh, check. You just need to add one bad payload to the packet, and then it can, um, it doesn't check the limit for the responses. So that's another question. I also want to ask why uh, Linux kernel implements things like this. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of discrepancy about uh, all the implementation of Windows, Mac OS, and uh, they seem to have their own implementation rather than stick to the standards. Yeah. Uh, Allison Mankin, Salesforce. Um, I, I really like this, and um, I also like the questions you were asking about why TCP is the way it is. Yeah. Um, it's a very old protocol, but I think those would be very good discussions to have in a TCP working group, um, as well as the mitigations you've talked about, and, um, and also check on whether the new transport protocols are you know, making some of the, I, I think there might be less mistake being made now. Uh, mm -hmm. But I had a quick question about um, your evaluation where you talk about the average time cost uh, was slide 35. I was wondering what that meant. What does average time cost mean? Is that for 10 successes to get through in that amount of time? Yeah, we launched the attack 10 times and then we calculate average time for all the all 10 attack. For all 10, okay. Because I wondered if, if um, connections are typically short which many of them are too short, is it much harder to make this attack? Yeah, that's um, actually it's feasible if you, I'm sorry. So I talked about this earlier. So um, these two connections are created by the draft script, which is under our control, right? So we can send arbitrary numbers of requests to the server so that the connection between the client and the server will be kept alive for a long time. As long as you keep sending requests, then the, uh, the connection will be alive. Uh, so the attacker can keep the connection yes. up a long time. Okay, I hadn't picked that up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so so I, I had a, a question. Uh, to, to, to what extent is this uh, specific to Wi-Fi? Do, 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 you, do you know if other wireless networks have similar issues? Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, this is a fundamental design choice of various protocols. So it's, and, and it, it of course makes perfect sense to use half duplex. It's, there's nothing wrong with half duplex and the wireless has to deal with it. So, um, so, that, so, we, uh, so we discussed this issue with the uh, IEEE 2 the working group and uh, yeah, they, although they um, acknowledge this vulnerability, but we can do nothing to it. Do, do, do you know if other wireless protocols have similar behavior? Did you look into that? No. Okay. Okay. All right. Any more? Sorry, Chris Seal. Just to extend that point, um, even though you don't know about it, presumably it would apply to any system that where the last link is half duplex. I'm sorry, could, could you repeat that? Presumably, uh -huh. the same attack would apply to any system where the last link is half duplex, yes. even, even if it's not Wi-Fi. 
Um, yeah, conceptually it is, okay. but I didn't find anything using half duplex. Thank you. Christian mm -hmm. Uh, have you considered mitigation such as using randomized uh, delays in routers and would they mitigate this kind of attacks? Yeah, that, that's a typical uh, mitigation, but um, you, you need to think about the implication because the delay can cause, I guess, if you want, if it will slow down the whole network, then it will be a, another problem, right? So I'm not sure. How yeah, of course, the, uh, you can delay, you can add more randomization here, there, but uh, I'm not sure how we can implement it without minimal cost. Okay. okay. Uh, are there any more questions? Okay, well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next up is Marie Jose. So, so uh, while Marie Jose is coming up, just a, a reminder that uh, okay, come up. Uh, ju ju just a, a reminder that nominations for the ANIP are open until the end of the week. So, if uh, if you've read any good uh, applied networking research papers, uh, please go to the website and, and nominate them for the prize for for, for next year. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Marie. I'm presenting in the name of uh, our three co-chairs, uh, Jeffrey, uh, Eve, and I. And we're COIN, uh, Computing in a Network. And uh, before I start, um, for the IEB people who heard us this morning, this is going to be old stuff. But at the same time, I would like to thank you for all your comments this morning and to have uh, actually highlighted new things that we should do in our group. It's not good enough? Again? Oh, my god. OK. Uh, so again, thanks AAB for hosting us and for the comments. So anyway, who are we? Uh, we're the people who want to put computing in the network or network in the computers, uh, essentially looking at the melding of computing, networking, and storage as things go forward. And so we want to foster research in computing in the network. Uh, we want to improve the performance for the networks themselves and for the application, especially the emerging applications in machine learning, in industrial networks, and in autonomous systems. Uh, where our focus um, is architectures. I'm actually an architect, so I'm interested in that. Uh, protocols, we have a lot of people in our group who like developing protocols. And also, because we also have the link to industrial R&D in the group, a lot of people are looking at real world uh, use cases, applications, and a lot of work in progress. We are a research group. We are not producing products. We're not even looking at doing products, but we're looking at new ways of using products, new ways of doing research with them, and even fundamental ways of changing maybe the way that we look at how, when we move information from place to another, what can we do to that information to make the whole thing work better? So how did we get there? Um, there was some active networking in the 90s, which was more or less successful, but got people thinking that when packets go through the network, maybe there's some functions that can actually carry, that can go with them. There was uh, work, I would say, in the past maybe five years in data centers and especially orchestration of data center elements uh, with the famous Paxos protocol, and I have to keep to this. I have the impression it's hitting me. Um, there was a development uh, by uh, Barefoot Networks, amongst others, of the Tofino switches and uh, who are programmable with the P4 language. Uh, Barefoot was purchased by Intel, which gave you know, the whole thing a new way maybe of looking at this computer architecture. Edge computing for a lot of us was our, <laughs> mainly our, our, our careers. It hit 
a lot of heritage from what people did in information-centric networking, name function networking, distributed network. Uh, there's actually another group, a research group in distributed networking that we plan really to, to collaborate with. Um, a lot of our um, collaborators uh, are working and worked on something that's called compute-first networking, which actually had two uh, very successful workshops even before that we were uh, even thought about as a potential research group. Um, I talked about the embedded um, uh, AI and ML. And also, if you think about it, up to now, a lot of people were thinking of applications. There were edge applications. There were cloud applications, maybe more and more just cloud. And there's a lot of applications that are poorly served if you only do um, cloud in terms of delays, in terms of intermittent connectivity, and a lot of things that maybe you want to do in between the, the two edges. So our history, uh, we first um, met in, in Montreal, um, close now 18 months ago. It's not Infocom, it's SIGCOM. Uh, we had a lot of meetings there. We met people at Usenix this year. We met in Bangkok, we met in Prague, we met in um, Montreal uh, during the summer. We're meeting here. Uh, we had two uh, web-based interims, and we had two hackathons on P4 and data um, filtering uh, in Montreal and actually over that weekend. We're meeting this week on Friday, so please come. Uh, we're very lucky that we have a bunch of collaborators uh, around the world. I was proud this week that we had also people from Singapore who collaborated to the hackathon and people from South America, so I think it was great that we were basically having people from everywhere. And so we have a really good mix of computer scientists, application developers, implementers, and people in industry. So it creates really a great way of discussing about where this is going. Um, so our, this is a work matrix. Um, this idea that there's the cloud, there's the edge, there's everything in between. And how can we distribute the computation inside the network to essentially make things better? And to make things better, it's not a single thing, and it's not a single set of requirements, and it's not a single set of uh, performance indicators. It actually depends on what the application and what the service needs. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go fast over this. But this is all part of the discussions that we've, we've been having for the past year. Uh, where do we want to put these things? Uh, Obviously, not all boxes uh, will perform network-related functions. There was actually a comment this morning about the fact that there's encrypted transports, and some of these things will not be compatible. Uh, what does it mean to do packet processing? To which level do we want to uh, act on the packets? Do we just want to filter them so we can do something uh, once the information filter with the residual error, which actually, the residual packets, which would be something that is very much related to AI. Um, maybe we just don't want just to do compute, but also storage. I said if we do packet filtering, we may want to store these things. Where do we want to store these things? How do we deal with discovering where they could be stored? How do we deal with the security of that data, the privacy, so it's all part of that. Uh, obviously, if I'm a developer, I don't want to specify where my computing is, but I may want to know how there's a discovery mechanism to allow me to find where this computing and this uh, caching, if necessary, will be done in the best way. And obviously, um, more and more in big data applications, there's an awful lot of data at the edge, and we may want to do some computing to reduce this information and manage the, this data implosion. I come from Canada. Uh, in the northern regions of Canada, there is, not, there is no broadband. And even if we want to have some big data applications there for monitoring the environment, for example, at one point we need to use a satellite to go up. And we may want to do some local processing before we do that. Uh, our objectives um, is to systematically look at these different uh, instantiations. Uh, we had comments from the beginning, and people who are here will recognize themselves. We're saying, well, are there any common principles? Are there common abstractions? Are there ways that we could do that in common? Or this will be completely a dislocated 
type of set of things that really don't work together. I think we find this may not be completely true, but there are common things. We're thinking of common data layers right now and at least common computing architectures. We want to know what are the best practices. Uh, we want, again, uh, to look at the, if there are non-forwarding functions, obviously not all um, nodes are forwarding and not nodes, all nodes will be computing. Um, and actually, what are the incentives to add this stuff uh, in the network so that um, new services and implementers know that it exists? Um, so, uh, what's the commonality? I said we looked at it. So, we want to select a programming paradigm. We want to marshal the resources. Obviously, we'll need to meet requirements. Constraint and policies. I've been working a lot in IoT and sensor networks recently, and there's a lot of constraints there. Uh, we want to be uh, adapt to changing condition, leverage telemetry, and again, this was very much highlighted this morning, these ideas of the security, the privacy, and the trust guarantees. We have to be able to trust the elements that do the computing. Uh, we've been very lucky. Uh, we've been there for one year, and we have uh, uh, tons of people who contributed drafts uh, to um, the group. And it covers, if you look at this, except security, which somebody again highlighted this morning, uh, all these drafts cover a lot of what we're interested in, uh, augmented reality, data discovery, managed networks, app centers, industrial use cases, which is also one of my big thing, requirements, which is essential, and uh, the transport issues, how are things when you look at end-to-end -end with encryption or even end-to-end -end principles and you want to start syncing computing element in between, how do you deal with that? And that's actually a big uh, question that we have. Um, so this is, I would like you to join us a Friday. And um, I think we're all very passionate about this. We think there's really cool stuff that we can do and we hope you can join us in our sound box. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie Hesse. Um, does anyone have any questions on this? Uh, any, any questions or comments? Either I was great and you guys are, are completely stunned, or I was terrible and you're all asleep. <laughs> Thank you anyway. Thank you. Thank you. So there's, there's some really interesting work in the, the coin group, so please do uh, consider joining them on Friday. Uh, I'm assuming you're all still here on Friday. All right, um, so what uh, we'd like to do for, for the rest of this meeting is spend a little bit of time um, thinking about uh, the relationship uh, between the IRTF and the IETF uh, and discussing some of the, the ways in which uh, the, the, the two organizations can interact uh, and uh, you know, move work between the two organizations and so on. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, Melinda first. Do you want to say a little bit about the relationship between the two? Uh, I don't have any slides, is that right? Okay. Uh, and we, we try and, you know, uh, we'd like this to be interactive, so uh, if you have any opinions, uh, pl please do jump up at the mic. And actually, the, the more I thought about this recently, the, the softer my opinions became, or, or squishier they became. Um, right, so no slides, and I, I apologize for that, but only a little bit. Um, yeah, so um, last August there was a uh, workshop on advanced um, cryptography standardization, and uh, Riyad Wabi, I don't know if he's here or not, gave a talk. Need to stand closer? Okay. Riyad Wabi gave a very good talk on um, work being done on, in the CFRG, and yeah, it was definitely worth listening to if you're curious about how to um, how to write crypto algorithm specifications. But at any way, um, he was he was sort of uh, he was sort of confused about what the CFRG does in relationship to standards and what the IRTF does in relation to standards. And he's someone who is active at it. Um, so in thinking about it, I, you know, I think that the way uh, IRTF research groups are increasingly functioning is blurring the lines between the IRTF and the IETF. They're, the way that meetings happen and the way that documents are handled are signaling that 
what's going on in IRTF research groups is actually standards related and that it is um, IETF related. So um, I took a look at 7418. Uh, thank you, Spencer. That was a, it's a great document. But it was written five years ago, and it was raising some of the same questions. I mean, section two, which is the, the bulk of the document, so it was like the, the IRTF is not the IETF and talked about some of these issues around how meetings are conducted, how documents are progressed, um, and, and so on. And, and so I, I think that as research groups are meeting more often with the IETF, um, we're adopting more and more of the IETF mechanisms, and some of these things do include things like the uh, use of internet drafts as documents rather than research papers. Um, the use of consensus-based decision-making, um, the notion that we want to agree on something rather than necessarily supporting a diversity of opinions. So, uh, so yeah, so basically, you know, I, the question is, as this increasingly happens, um, we, I, you know, I, my feeling is that we need, sort of need to accept things as they happen, but I also think that we need to be careful to preserve what we care about in the IRTF, the research orientation, and, and, and continue our focus on producing sort of ideas and enlightenment rather than specifications and engineering. Uh, this is showing up in, in research group proposed charters as well, in particular, um, and, and this is an area that I think could use a lot more focus. So, uh, so that's basically it. Um, you know, as Colin said, this is a, an opportunity for discussion and sharing opinions and um, trying to figure out how we want to go forward uh, and whether or not there's anything that needs to change. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any, anything to, to raise? Oh, good. Dirk. Hi, I'm, I'm Dirk Kutscher. Um, yeah, in, in general, I fully agree. Um, so we have to be careful not to um, develop a certain, you know, ossified model of doing our research here in, in, in the um, IRTF. And um, also when we talk about what makes a IRTF research group um, successful or what is a good relationship and so on, um, of course, it's, it's nice if we can, you know, move some work to the ITF at some point. On the other hand, it's, it's going down. <laughs> 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 On the other hand, um, it's also valuable output if we, you know, are able to invalidate certain assumptions and, for example, are able to say, okay, this actually doesn't make sense for the internet and maybe we explored it, but uh, enough is enough and let's move on. Yes, f f fully agree. Um, we, we don't have to produce something which can go further. We could, you know, we, we can explore something and then say, yeah, we, we, we've done it. Hi, uh, Brian Trammell. Uh, I was looking at the, the list of, or the, the big, all of the um, research groups we have now, and it's cool that we're almost all meeting, and I think Dinergy was also scheduled and then didn't end up getting these schedules, so we almost had all of the meeting here. And one of the things that struck me about the scopes of those is that they're, they don't really overlap, but there are a lot of places where, you know, there's kind of gray areas maybe between COIN and some of the stuff that might come out of PanRG eventually and between COIN and DINRG and, you know, all of these in T to T and part of, like, they're all kind of looking at the same sort of problem space, which is what's next for the internet with an internet focus, but from different perspectives. That would not work at all in the IETF, right? Like having two working groups working on exactly the same thing is an excellent way to annoy the IESG. Um, the, uh, I hear a couple of ex-area directors laughing. The, um, the idea of the IRTF is sort of a lab for the IETF. Um, I think you actually do see it in the set of, of research groups that we have right now. I really like um, Dirk's suggestion, right? Like, so it, it, it or actually, was it, I'm really jet lagged. One of the two of you just said this um, uh, about like, hey, we have to we have to be a little bit bolder about allowing things to fail, right? Like so, or or like you know, let's spin it up and let's have a look at it. And the the idea that the success is something's going to come out of this, it's going to go into standardization, shouldn't be the goal. And maybe I'm just saying that because I'm a co-chair of PanRG, um, which has like a very 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 long time scale for anything that might ever come out of that and, and be standards, right? Um, 
so yeah, I think the 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 let's keep throwing things at the wall and see what sticks model works pretty well. I think we've done a pretty good job of avoiding a, an anti-pattern that that may have shown up in the past that was, um, you know, the an a research group is your consolation prize for a failed boff. Um, I think continuing to push back on that anti-pattern is a good, and I also say that as a co-chair of Panergy. Um, the, uh, the, I, I think pushing back on that anti-pattern is a, a, uh, a good one to continue doing. So, um, yeah, I think we're actually doing a pretty reasonable job here. Uh, Laurent Chavalier. <clears throat> I think this is a very important question to, for the IRTF and IETF to discuss. Maybe we can also consider not necessarily already the stage where there is a research group being proposed, but more there is a research question or a research topic and how and where it could be addressed. I mean, maybe IRTF and IETF have some ways of seeing the world or approach problems, but they may be also wider scope if we think ITUT, HC, other groups, or even, I mean, other organizations, not necessarily standards related, may also be other opportunities to, the, the stage or the life cycle of a research idea or research proposal can go through different groups and be matured at some stage and then maybe be brought up to the IRTF and maybe go somewhere else. So I will consider very important IRTF, IETF, but maybe also try to widen a bit the scope because there may be other groups or stakeholders that could have good views or good competency in uh, progressing a research idea in the overall ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly a lot of uh, the research groups have historically had pretty close links to uh, academic conferences in the area. Uh, and I, I, I guess the network management group would be one of them, but uh, it's certainly not the only one. Uh, the, the, the quantum internet group, I think, has, has recently close interactions with some of the conferences in that space too. Hi, Stephen Farrell. Uh, so I think one of the, there's, I think there's lots of good aspects of the IRTF being close to the IETF. One of the less good aspects, I think, is that research group chairs find it hard to deal with a lack of consensus. Um, in the IETF, we're looking for rough consensus. I don't, that doesn't need to be the case in research groups, but I think more and more, it seems like there's a tendency to try and, you know, reach the same bar of rough consensus Whereas I think research groups would sometimes be better publishing something that's, whether it's a draft or an RFC or something, that's, you know, this is this person's opinion. Lots of other people don't agree with it, but it's still an opinion. Uh, I think it would be good if research groups were more encouraged to allow that kind of lack of consensus. Yes, yes I, I think that's a very good point. You do not need research group consensus to publish an RFC. You need to have an interesting document which uh, the group thinks is worth publishing and the, the IRSG agrees. Yeah. And you know, as, as long as it's clear that this is an, an opinion piece rather than a consensus piece, that's just fine. Yeah, I think maybe maybe it needs a bit more encouragement. Yeah. yeah. You know, I I equally, um, research groups are not um, uh, are not evaluated based on the number of RFCs they produce. <laughs> Tall people. Um. <laughs> One tall person. Right. Um, wow, now I forgot what I was going to say. I, I did forget what I was going to say. You, you go ahead. Um, Jana Iyengar. Um, so I want to second what Stephen said. Uh, I think it's valuable for IRTF uh, research groups to recognize that um, the processes of the IETF might be convenient because they're familiar, but they're not necessary. And we certainly shouldn't uh, stick to them as though they are required. I use, I've, I've just been um, considering how to, as, as chair of ICCRG, I've been trying to figure out how to publish documents in ICCRG and what it means for us to publish documents. And I've been in conversation with CFRG chairs and other folks and trying to understand that. At the end of several long conversations, the conclusion I came to was, doesn't fucking matter. You do what you do and you publish something useful and ultimately whether it gets used or not is a function of a large number of things but our 
uh, uh, goal in ICCRG is to publish documents that are interesting, that might be relevant. And it's not so much to try and uh, uh, come up with one right answer for various things. So I, I, I want to just take a moment to say that it's very useful, uh, I think, for the IRTF to be associated with the IETF because it gives relevance, it gives uh, 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 a space where we can understand problems from a practical point of view, from what matters to the standards point of view. At the same time, I think it's also useful for the IRTF to be slightly independent of the IETF and to think of itself as independent from the IETF. It doesn't need to be driven by IETF, it doesn't need to be driven by things that will go back into the IETF or problems that are necessarily coming out of the IETF. So it occupies an interesting space and in that I will just say one last thing which is it provides a venue. It's not just the work that's happening in the research groups. I see increasingly ICCRG as a venue, as a community where we are able to bring people in from, from academia, from the industry, from standards uh, uh, areas. I have people who come only for ICCRG from the industry, and they also happen to be in the IETF. But that's, that's what I want to foster. I want to have that community be built and the community to be available so that when we actually have problems in the IETF that needs this community, we have the community available on hand. I remembered what I was going to say. Um, you know, we, we've talked about the IRTF not being a forum for, for sort of advanced engineering within the ITF context. Um, but there does seem to be demand for that activity to take place somewhere. The IETF uh, working groups are very, very narrowly scoped. They have very specific deliverables. But often people want, <clears throat> people want to talk about engineering problems more broadly. And, um, and because there is not a, any place for that within the IETF, I think that tends to push that into the IRTF a bit. Um, and it's n really not within the IRTF purview to deal with that, but it is something that I think we might want to be talking about with the IETF. Yeah, I think that's an, Im an important point. The, the, the IRTF works, the, the IETF working groups are very uh, narrowly scoped. The IRTF is very blue sky. Uh, and uh, we, we've had a couple of discussions of, with, uh, you know, th there's a gap in the middle. And we, we, several people have mentioned this. Yeah. Uh, Dan Bogdanovich, I wanted to say the same thing. And we can take an example of the Network Management Research Group and the NetMod, NetCom. You know, where one is very detailed, you know, down to the bits and pieces, and the other one is very blue sky, and sometimes challenging some of the thinking about in a new framework, new architecture, how to do things that are being done in the ITF. Getting such feedback from the IRTF would be useful, and trying to say, hey guys, stop working on something that has been 20 years as a general accepted concept try to think in, the, in this new terms, and getting some of those new thoughts from the, IRT, from the IRTF would be helpful. Yes. Yes. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I suspect the scheduling could be made to work if people want to, you know, joint sessions to have these discussions. Hi, um, this is Eve Schuler from Intel. Um, so I like this discussion a lot, uh, so thank you for bringing it up. I, it points out to me, at least, that in some ways, this discussion around relationships with IETF is around what's our metric for success in the IRTF. And maybe one of the predominant ones is, you know, informing the IETF. But I, it also raises the question, or, you know, what are these other ones? And some of the relationships that are spawning now among some of these other groups, if you look at um, the research group thing to thing, it has to do with sort of the broader community and many of the relationships with other standards bodies. Um, and so it just got me thinking about metrics of success and best known methods and things like that. And I wonder if collectively as a, as a research community within the IETF, we can catalog some of those and sort of share some of those um, in terms of like what are our objectives as a community and then ultimately help the IETF more. So just thinking out loud. Um, and uh, recognizing that there, there are more metrics to success beyond simply the relationship with the IETF. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I think that is certainly true. And, uh, you know, 
a, a research group does not is not necessarily expected to produce anything which would be useful to the IETF. Yeah, it, it's that it's there to understand the problem space. It's learned that there to have to, to explore some ideas, um, produce some new knowledge, and occasionally that is that leads to that leads the group to a place where you know a, 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 another effort can be spun up in the IETF to then standardize something based on that outcome. But that's that's not necessarily uh, the, the metric for success, although it's a, a metric for success, and you know. Uh, just, just understanding a problem better, producing a bunch of papers, producing a bunch of PhDs, is a perfectly reasonable, successful outcome for a research group. Next. So uh, I think the points I, I would like to highlight, don't, as, as a research group, don't feel that you have to follow the ITF process. Don't feel you have to have consensus. Um, it's often convenient to meet here and that, that there's good reasons to meet co-located with the IETF because it gets some nice discussions and interactions with the standards community and with the, the people building products. Um, but meet in other places. You know, meet, meet with conferences, meet, have workshops, do, do, do whatever helps advance your research. Um, I, I'm sure Alison will remember that uh, some years ago, um, I seem to remember the reliable multicast group meeting on the beach in Cannes next to the SIGCOM conference. So we can, meet in, we can meet in all sorts of places. It doesn't just have to be a, in a windowless meeting room next to an ITF meeting. Okay. Uh, Tim Buttenberg, I think actually that's a very interesting remark because this also promotes the IETF in those other places. So uh, we talked a lot about how the IRTF maybe can contribute to the IETF but uh, let's not forget that there's also another way around so that there's, uh, that, that this is an opportunity to, to maybe get new people interested in what we are doing within the ITF as well. So thank you for the remark. Yes, it's, it's, um, it's a way of fostering um, discussion between the, the, the industrial side and the very academic side. And I think that's a, a very nice role the IRTF can play. All right, next up is, is it Aaron or Laurent? Or? There we go. There's not that much on the slide. No, the other side. There we go. Okay. Okay, we've got most of the slide up. Yeah, and some. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Aaron Falk. Whoops. Gone. Slide's gone. I, I can't talk without the notes. Um, so before Colin was IRTF chair, and before Allison was IRTF chair, and before Lars was IRTF chair, for about six years I was IRTF chair, and um, uh, Colin asked me to, um, uh, and uh, Laurent to work together to uh, uh, prompt some discussion on examples of IRTF-ITF collaboration. And so this is mostly one person's opinion. Uh, maybe folks will disagree with some of these. Um, but I think there's a lot of different models that are represented on this slide of uh, things that I think work well and some things I think are anti-patterns and some which uh, might or might not be um, uh, uh, good patterns. Some of, you know, uh, probably more, in some cases I'm unsure, in some cases I just don't know enough. But, um, so let me just walk through a few of these and maybe folks can add to them or come up with some other examples. I think that the more that we can share uh, best practices of how uh, IRTF, ITF collaboration works well, um, the better it's going to be. And you'll notice in, uh, the arrows don't always point in one direction. Um, so uh, I think a, a good recent example is the um, ICC NRG, the congestion control um, I think I have an extra letter. The, the Congestion Control Research Group. I, I got it wrong. Uh, but the Congestion Control Research Group uh, has uh, performed a valuable role in vetting congestion control proposals. There was a time when people would bring uh, their research project in congestion control to the IETF and ask, them to, ask us to put it into TCP, um, which has a number of fallacies in it, um, one of which um, 
the ITF doesn't standardize congestion control, or at least it didn't then. I guess it's, it's more down there now. Uh, but also that there wasn't really uh, the, uh, there's a lot of questions in terms of how things are going to work in the real world uh, um, before or you um, start to take a position as to whether it's something that you want to roll out into the internet. And so um, that uh, this research group was created and one of the, f the valuable functions that they did was to uh, bring together researchers who are familiar with congestion control and, and research in that area um, to evaluate proposals and then make some recommendations as to whether um, ITF protocols should support it. Um, a different example is uh, in the delayed tolerant networking folks. This was a, uh, a fairly large research uh, project, multi-institution research project, who wanted to see the protocols become standardized, um, but there are a bunch of open issues, and so uh, a research group was created uh, to, um, to come up with, uh, to kind of sort through what the research community had done and implemented, um, and, uh, and out of that came some proposals for standardization, and working, a working group was spun up to standardize that. So that was, um, uh, I guess that's a little bit more of a one-way arrow. I guess uh, maybe, Stephen, you could, was there, were there things that came out of the ITF working group that fed back into the research group? No, okay, so that was a one-way arrow, great. Um, uh, network management research group, um, uh, I guess uh, Laurent can comment to this, was uh, um, um, the proposals through there uh, um, uh, became part of the ANIMA working group in the IETF. Um, CFRG, I think we've already talked about a little bit, that um, it uh, brings together a bunch of uh, folks from the crypto community who aren't naturally participants in the IETF process, um, who um, evaluate cryptographic proposals and um, make some recommendations that the IETF can then use to, uh, to evaluate uh, protocols. Um, and so the, uh, I guess the way that I understand the security area works is they, there's sort of a deference to the CFRG to, uh, to give like a thumbs up or thumbs down on crypto proposals. And so that's, uh, that's sort of a, you know, you're bringing in, a, in a, an area of expertise that isn't really present in the IETF, but the IETF relies on uh, quality in that area. Um, and so that's a, sort of a, a um, it's a little bit like the, uh, the congestion control idea. Um, there, there seems to be a couple of groups where there's, um, there's, there's a bunch of expertise in the research community um, which develop a, you know, interesting ideas, um, you know, whether that's congestion control or, or crypto, and, and demonstrate that they work. And then uh, the IETF groups say, yeah, that's useful to us. And, uh, well, they, they so I think it's, a, it's a, maybe a little more nuanced than that, that in some cases they're coming up with ideas. I think in this case, like CFRG, is they're evaluating uh, proposals that come from outside. So, if you, uh, so there's a vetting process um, uh, that uh, requires expertise that isn't uh, present in the IETF. Yeah, there's, there's a, if I remember right, they seem to run a bunch of competitions for, you know, we, 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 we want an, an algorithm to do this, and you know, some proposals come in and they evaluate them and figure out which ones work. Yeah, but um, reliable multicast uh, is, uh, um, uh, a, a fairly old uh, or long-lived activity uh, in the ITF, and uh, 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 but I think that's a that's an example of uh, research that uh, turned into some standardization. Didn't solve all the problems, um, uh, but uh, there's uh, uh, some protocol work that came out of it. Um, there, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer research group um, uh, um, was uh, kind of had a whole burst of energy. Uh, I think that came out of some uh, issues in industry, uh, and then the research group was trying to come up with uh, metrics for uh, evaluating aspects of peer-to-peer -peer protocols, and then the, the Alto working group came out of that. So these are, I think, these are different kinds of success. Um, some. Uh, uh, let me go to the anti-patterns, and then I'll come back to the uncertain ones, and maybe that that'll be the start of some discussion. So, uh, the name servers research group. Um, was um, kind of winding down when I came into the IRTF, um, but for a long time um, I had heard uh, like that you know next generation DNS is happening in this research group, and the research group um, was closed and uh, never actually published anything. And so I think that's an example of where nothing came into the IETF, um, and so uh, uh, that wasn't a, a very effective way of collaboration. Um, uh, you know, that's. Uh, like we said in the last session, that's not always the objective of a research group, but I think in, uh, 
Uh, I think there, w there was a bunch of uh, proposals that went into the ITF and then were redirected into this research group and then nothing came back. So I think that that probably uh, was a little bit of a swing and a miss uh, for the organization. Uh, Anti-spam research group, um, I think that there, uh, there were hopes that uh, there would be proposals for how to deal with spam that came out of this group. Um, I think that very little ITF activity actually uh, took off from that. I, I'm happy to be corrected from that. I'm looking at S Stephen. I don't know. All right, so not you. Um, so uh, uncertain. Um, HIP was, a, I think, an interesting ITF activity. There was a bunch of energy in the hallways to, uh, to implement HIP. HIP was a, uh, proposed as a, uh, an alternative architecture for uh, addressing a bunch of problems at the time in, in the ITF. And um, uh, um, they uh, tried a few boffs to get work going in the ITF. Uh, I think that the, it was, uh, my opinion is it was proposed as a little bit too sweeping in terms of what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, and for that reason, it sort of bounced off that, you know, uh, we charter working groups if we think that they're focused and they're going to, you know, uh, have narrow goals and accomplish those goals in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And um, so then they became a research group. Um, and I think that uh, um, it, uh, there's been some HIPAA implementation, but I don't think it had the deployment that uh, they had hoped for. Do you want to comment now, Alison, or wait yeah, till Yeah, I'd like it if you define uncertain, because you're starting uncertain with HIP saying it didn't really succeed, and when you and I had a little exchange about this in email, oh, I'm Alison Menken, um, it was, um, you said it didn't really mean that, so. Well, so uh, uh, my feeling is that this is a, uh, that this characterization is, I'm uncertain about, uh, it, it, to me it is, a, is, an, uh, it is not obviously a good example or a bad example of IRTF, IETF collaboration. And so I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag. So I feel like uh, uh, HIP, I don't think is a clear example of like it working really well. Um, and, um, uh, um, but it is an example of something that was sort of, there was stuff happening in the IETF and in the IRTF. So there was some collaboration. So I'm uncertain as to whether I would call it a good example or necessarily something that we should, uh, an anti-pattern. So that's. Okay, I'm gonna stay at the mic. Okay, for when great. You continue. Um, so the routing research group is, uh, this is a, uh, uh, when I came in to the IRTF, the routing research group had been around for a long time. Um, and I think that it, uh, it was not a good example of uh, collaboration in that what I saw of it was that um, proposals that the IETF didn't want to deal with were redirected to the routing research group. Um, uh, uh, oftentimes that they would just not come to the ITF. Um, the end-to-end -end research group, and I, th uh, 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 I think is, um, uh, I, oh, so I put this in the worked well column uh, based on your comments, and I think that Colin didn't get my updated slides. So let me, let me speak as if it was in the worked well column because um, your comment, I, I was persuaded by your earlier comment, Allison, um, that it was, it was an example of a bunch of research activity that found its way into the IETF um, in, I think, uh, uh, a less, um, it was a much longer lived uh, uh, research activity, and so it was a less uh, sort of, uh, uh, not the same kind of example of something that was focused like DTN, um, but something where there was a, you know, was a lot of research that happened over time. Um, it was a closed research group, and um, so it was kind of indirect in how things came out of the research group and into the IETF. There were a few examples of drafts, but there were also research papers and implementation projects that came in. And so it's a very different animal than some of the other stuff in the left-hand column, but I do think it's a good example of, um, uh, of the collaboration. And then so the QIRG... It, it was a, a very open-ended activity, as I understand. Yeah, so in de measured in decades, yes. Uh, popped out, yeah. Um, and so QIRG I put in here because it's new, I, uh, it's uncertain, but I think that it's a, uh, so um, I, I don't want to say yet that it's, uh, it is a great example of, uh, of IRTF, IETF collaboration because there's really been very little IETF activity except for the fact that there was a, a QIRG tutorial which was very popular. And so if you want to look for uh, a different kind of uh, uh, pattern of IETF, IRTF collaboration, a sort of an education approach of like here's an interesting a research area that is related to networking and, uh, um, and may have uh, eventually uh, activities in the IETF, but in the, in the near term is 
uh, a source of information and educating and sort of raising the clue level in IETF participants, then I think QIRG is sort of an interesting example of that. So at this point, um, how about so, um, the one thing I would want to add is end to end, it really did, it, it was a task force before and it was a peer of the IETF, so it was a different animal go indeed uh, when it first started out and for like 20 years, but to be you know, clear to people who might not know, it incubated our entire media, you know, the, the, the uh, internet media protocols, it incubated DiffServe, it incubated um, ECN, all kinds of stuff that we wouldn't have without it. So what kind of thing could be like that in future? I'm not sure, maybe nothing, but it was actually very high impact on the ITF, just quite different from the research groups we have now. Hi, um, Stukard. I, I have to kind of agree with your characterization of, of HIP in terms of a, a burst of promising activity and then a, a long dormant period. But I would like to say that the rumor of HIP's death is greatly exaggerated. And I think the reason that it may not have been a, a poster child for IRTF, uh, IETF transition is that perhaps it transitioned a little early before there was um, a clear uh, application pull for the technology, um, but the uh, the trustworthy multipath remote identification BOF tomorrow morning is uh, an application pull for which we think uh, HIP is actually an excellent fit. HIP in our time, uh, very exciting. <laughs> Christian, Christian Wittema. Yeah, Owen. At the time, there were some uh, research group that were closed membership and some that were open. Is, did you observe any kind of relation between the fact that something was closed and its success or not? Well, uh, two of the groups on here, the, the only two that I know of uh, closed groups are on this list. So the Name, uh, name Servers Research Group, uh, NSRG, I can't remember if Name Servers is the correct, ex correct expansion, but the uh, the names research group was uh, closed, and then also end-to-end -end research group was closed. Yeah. And so I think we've got both sort of a positive and a negative example, so I don't think we can draw conclusions. Also, the, this is pretty far back. I don't think that there have been any closed research groups in recent memory. No. Um, okay. Everybody's shaking their head. So, um, yeah. I, yeah. but I, I, I actually, I think, Christian, you raised a point that I wanted to make earlier on in the, uh, in the discussion in the last section, which is, um, there's an enormous, you know, the IETF is very con has a very constrained process because we want to be open, transparent, and uh, standards organization. The IRTF has none of that, and there's a lot of flexibility in how research groups can operate. And, there, and that discretion is uh, typically given to the research group chair to organize it in a way that, you know, keeps the energy up and accomplishes stuff. And so um, well, uh, making a group, a group closed is one aspect of that, but, there, but meeting in other locations is another piece of that. And I don't know if it's still the case, but, uh, but it was for a while. Uh, the only requirement was that you should meet once a year at an ITF meeting to promote some collaboration and cross-fertilization of ideas. But other than that, you can pretty much do what you want. I think that's a great thing. Yep. Yep. David? Yeah. So I was going to comment on a couple of things. First. End-to-end -end as a closed research group is going to leave people with the wrong impression. It was closed in that membership and participation was by invitation only, but the chairs were incredibly clueful in figuring out who to invite and reach out to and move forward. Um, so that, that was quite a bit of, the other thing I was going to do, I think is probably mostly on your, on, on your next slide. So are you going to get to that or do you want to talk I about I wasn't actually going to present, prevent the next slide. That was more sort of reflection on stuff and I thought that the, the discussion, the reflection from the folks in the room was probably more interesting than, okay, so than that. But if you a, want to go to the next slide, we can. Well, having got a glimpse of your next slide, um, I think the, the different forms of transfer is really insightful because what ha because you're, the first bullet there basically is an incubation. Um, it's pre-standards and the goal is to spawn standards activity, and a group that started that way needs to have the courage to say, we've done the job, we're getting out of business. The second line is an area of overlapping expertise. 
uh, where for both uh, ICCRG and CFRG, you can identify a community of expertise, strongly grounded in research, that is complementary to the standards work that we do here. And that's a really good structure because it avoids inflicting the research on the protocol development and the protocol development practicalities on the researchers. Laurent should get credit for making most of this slide, so, since it's so insightful. And I agree with your comments. Uh, Wes, Wes Herdiker, ISI. Um, one other good thing that came out of it, and when, when you're totally done, I have a much longer thought train to, to expound upon for, for both the previous presentation and this one, but the NMRG was also actually the root for NetConf and Yang, and it was a, a short-term model that, you know, has certainly heavily affected the IETF today. And, uh, you know, it started as sort of a fairly short project of two to three years uh, that it was too long to do in the IETF and, and the research, you know, was the right place for it to start. And then it's certainly transformed a lot since then, but it's a great te uh, tech transition story. Thanks, Wes. I wasn't involved in that, so it's helpful to know. Yeah. Spencer. Uh, please finish your slide. I don't feel the need to say anything else. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Hi, uh, this is Dave Moran. I, um, you focused on a bunch of things in the IRTF that have had, um, for better or worse, interesting characteristics in their interaction with the IETF. There, there are a few of the things here where we also want to look at our failure models as well as our success models. And I can think of at least a few research groups, which I will not name, um, that, were, that wound up getting chartered and then we discovered that there actually weren't any interesting research problems. Um, and they bounced around for a while, and um, they, weren't, they couldn't produce a standard because they weren't in the IETF, and yet uh, we discovered that what, what, what was happening in those research groups wasn't research. Uh, so one of the things I think we do need to sort of guard against is allowing groups to keep going on and on and on uh, with not understanding what the boundary is, and there actually aren't any interesting research problems in that domain uh, that could drive a research agenda. So just a word of caution there. I, so, uh, so I guess uh, my first response to your comments is that um, that's none of the that's ones that for the discussion. For the for this, this is about IRTF ITF uh, uh, collaboration. But to respond to the, to, to the some of, substance some of that. Some of the groups which will go unnamed, in fact, were chartered because there were things that were believed to be needed in the research community that weren't ready for the IETF to deal with. And that kind of collaboration with the thought that things might transition into the IETF uh, were, were motivations for forming those groups. So I, let me just reiterate my point. There have to be interesting research problems independent of whether um, the output is something that winds up in the IETF or not. Uh, I Wait. Mean, this, this, to some extent, is the difference between research and development. <laughs> you know, that we, we need to find interesting research problems, not just interesting advanced development problems. I, well, maybe you and I disagree on this, but I think that there's room in the IRTF for both if there's an energized community that wants to work on it. Um, because, uh, I, this is, again, my personal opinion is that uh, the IETF uh, succeeds with things that are pretty well defined, and there are things that are not very researchy that may need more definition. I think having them happen in the IRTF is okay, but that's different from, uh, so I think that there's a lot of different kinds of things that can grow in the IRTF, um, and I, I think that I don't see a benefit to creating another organization to hold those things. Uh, uh, because um, f sometimes it takes people with, uh, you, you know, it's that research and, uh, uh, and implementation collaboration that, uh, the sort of joint expertise that it takes to sort of get them over the line so that they can be baked here. So I don't disagree with Dave, you know, they don't always succeed. I mean, this, the, the list of uh, concluded research groups, for some value of concluded, um, is much longer than the list of active ones. Uh, of course, of course. Um, I, I think we, we need to be clear that there is, um, that we, we believe there are research issues before we charter a group. Um, and you know, You're the boss. Yeah. 
you know, my, 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 my view tends to be that uh, if it's just that it could be engineering, it's just a longer term focus than a, an I, a typical IETF group. To, to me, that, that should be a, a, perhaps a different type of IETF activity. I don't want to get into semantics on where you draw the line between research and engineering, but I think it's, I think it's hard to come up with an objective measure on what that is. The, there's always a bunch of things in a gray area. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, but ultimately, the judgment on whether it's in or not is yours. That's what counts. I'm a lucky man. Uh, somebody at the microphone say something. Yeah, so um, Spencer Dawkins, and um, I, wanted to, I wanted to thank uh, Colin for putting this topic forward and Aaron for doing this presentation. I wanted to cut down to your, your bottom bullet uh, about documenting this talk, topic more precisely. Uh, it seems like to me that one of the things when we succeed in um, research groups, at least some of the time, we, we do that by involving a lot of people that don't understand the IETF very well. And that means that it makes transition hard, um, especially if they don't know what's been tried before and what has been tried that has worked out badly. Um, back in the day, um, not very long after Lars became uh, IRTF chair, uh, he had me working on what became, I think it's uh, RC 7418, that's the uh, IRTF primer for IETF participants. And what we, what we, the problem we were shooting at back then was people coming from the IETF uh, with, you know, the understanding of the IETF process, and that's not the way the IRTF works. And the thing is, I don't know, it's like, I don't know, eight or ten pages long, something like that. It's not, it's not very long, but it, like, it, it has the list about, you know, scope and time frames and, <laughs> you know, participation and, and meeting places and stuff like that. Um, but that was the problem that we were dealing with. That was the problem the chair of the IRTF was dealing with then. Um, and it seems like to me that because we don't have the same research groups now, and we don't have the same ITF, and we don't have the same IRTF chair, uh, it seems like the problems that the IRTF chair is facing now is more the, you know, getting things slotted in the right place in the first, you know, on the first bounce so that it's not the fail boff consolation prize that people tried to make it. Um, and, uh, and, and how, you know, just documenting what the models are. You know, um, DTNRG basically kind of picked up stakes and moved to the IETF. You know, that's a model. Um, other people have uh, models like ICCRG, which is a completely different model. I would, I would caution against trying to make this very precise because the research groups are really, this, you know, the scopes are big, whether the research groups are, are big or not, and they're really different, you know, and we don't have a lot of them to base, to base you know, criteria on. But to just even write down, you know, what, is, what happened in the past and how it turned out, which is, uh, oddly, uh, the PANRG draft on what not to do, uh, you know, is kind of doing for path aware networking, but to basically do the same kind of thing for the IRTF uh, and the IETF interaction. Yes. I, Wes? I think that's important. Yeah, Wes heard a How are we doing on time? Uh, we, we've got a couple of minutes. So uh, okay. if, if we close the, the, the lines after these, these okay. comments. Did you say 10 minutes? There's another talk. A, a couple of minutes. We've got another talk. Okay. All right. I can go on for 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, I think looking at both the last two talks, right, they're, they're very informative in how do we think about the IRTF over the, over the longer term and especially working groups and, and when they're successful. And there's a real challenge there because uh, there's a width issue, right? IRTF groups need to span from, you know, far-reaching research that, you know, is looking out in the far distant future to stuff that needs to transition, you know, fairly quickly. Um, and it actually specifically transition to application and, and real uh, interoperability. And so, you know, you can look at results as, uh, you know, we look to, we measured this really cool thing, we found out that nothing needs to change, that's still a success, right? Um, we've looked at a problem space and we found that there is a problem, we're creating new work or a new working group out of it, that's great. Um, and we have improvements and suggestions and that got transferred into, you know, into protocol changes, you know, on the wire. Um, 
So that's the easy thing, but the thing is, is the success possibilities for a research group are so wide that it might actually be easier to look at what do we not want. And so I have a couple of examples of that, of which in, you know, research groups that, that fail might include research groups that produce no documents. I think you had an example of that. Um, research groups that looked at a problem space, found a solvable problem, but failed to find an audience, right? Where it just sort of fell on deaf ears, uh, and then that would be a problem. And similarly, you know, deaf ears, when you discover protocol deficiencies in existing stuff based on research that failed to actually transition to fixes. And like actually the, present, the, the, the winner uh, presentation from today is a good example of that, of trying to figure out where, where ca how can we get that fixed? And if it doesn't get fixed, that's to some extent a failure. I would say the, the most insidious example of uh, um, something that doesn't belong in the IRTF is uh, a, you know, a particular uh, company proposal that is uh, trying to create something that looks like an open forum uh, but doesn't have a constituency. Uh, I saw several examples of that when I was IRTF chair, and I think that was the... That it's like, okay, maybe there's interesting work here, but it's just like your little narrow thing. There's nobody who wants to collaborate with you, you know, and so we're not going to create a group for you, no matter how many people you have show up. So, um, but I, yeah, I think your examples are good as well. Eric. Uh, Eric Nordmark. So listening to you guys debating on stage sort of the boundary between research and advanced development, I mean, I think that there is this other space where what does the IETF do versus the IRTF when there's some new work coming in and people sort of have some vague notion that eh, there might be something here but the proponents don't seem to be able to describe it very well or sort of, uh, you know, is, is it because they don't understand the problem space, the solution space, the constituents, but, but it's rather vague, right? And those things get tossed around and sometimes it might depend on, on IRTF chairs, some of it might have landed in the IRTF, um, other times, the ADs have worked with these people for sometimes for many um, ITF meetings to try to sort of distill something out of it. Sometimes the IAB or an IAB member gets appointed as a shepherd to try to help them, and maybe it leads to a buff or something. But that's one of the challenging spaces where we believe that we want to be open and invite this new work, but but it's not necessarily that well formed. And I'm not arguing that that should land in the IHF, it's just that we collectively should you know, sort of figure out a way of, of, of handling that, right, as opposed to it being bounced around. But. I think that's an excellent point. Do you have a proposal? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have time for Rich? L last one. Last All right, one. Rich, All right, right, so I just want to talk, uh, mention on the, on the bottom two sub-bullets, um, I, I think it's always good to like write things down. But you want to be careful to make sure that it doesn't become a requirement that all research must successfully transfer. Um, and the learnings, I think, if written from the CFRG side, ver sorry, from the research side versus the IETF side, they might be very different, which would also be interesting. Yeah, it's a good point. I should have added a column on my chart that was uh, no transfer, and it was still a great thing uh, because there's a bunch of research groups, especially that are active now, that fall into that category. Okay, thank you, everybody. Yes. Uh, yep. So, f thank you, Aaron. Uh, and, and yes, to be clear, th there is absolutely no requirement that uh, anything transitions in standardization. Um, you know, we, we uh, as, as a research group, you, you, you know, the idea is to develop some ideas, some technology. Um, a, a group of people may look at the outcome of a research group and say this is appropriate for standardizing. Uh, they, they may not, and it's a success either way, as long as we learn something. All right, so having spent some time talking about how the IRTF and the IETF can interact, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the IRTF and uh, the broader academia can interact. Um, hi, it's me again. Um, and for the people who started hearing me at 7.15 this morning, I promise it's the last time. Um, so this started, I mentioned when I did the uh, coin presentation that we had two um, interims, and this discussion actually started at our last interim in October, 
And we figured out that it was a topic that was much bigger than a research group. It was something that was for the whole IRTF. So I would like to thank um, everybody and the COIN community. Uh, Yana talked about communities. Well, that's one of them. And uh, especially Lars, who sent us a set of very interesting slides. And actually, I borrowed one. So that were the comments. Um, academics do not do drafts. Good point. Um, attendance from professors and students is often uh, very difficult for questions of budgets and because, you know, we, we seem to be the roaming um, conference here and it's, it's true, you know, it costs money. Um, we need to do a better job of connecting academia and IRTF. I agree. The other inputs, uh, one of them was from Colin, was that, well, there's more than drafts. The drafts is the IETF uh, way of moving forward, but maybe there's something else. And maybe the typical draft format is ill-suited for, for research discussions, and also the typical draft presentation format. Um, at a lot of IRTF meeting, uh, we would like to know the progress of the research or the new ideas in research, not just the delta from the last version of the, uh, of the draft. So, we decided that, okay, let's, let's get some thoughts around this and let's look also what happened in the past. And I promised someone that was going to discuss this, but a few years ago I was on an HDR evaluation in France uh, for somebody who had an impeccable um, what a way of applying for this. I, I didn't even know how we could say that this person was not going to get this. And then one of the reviewers said, but look at his publication record. He's got eight RFCs, but not a lot of publications. And my, you know, my first thing was that he's got, you know, wow, that's, that's amazing. And that if you think of the usual uh, people who read a conference paper, there's three. Think of how many people read a draft before it becomes an RFC. And the, the amount of comments that you get from all kinds of people, uh, from all kinds of, of sources, and you know, I thought it was amazing, but it was actually highlighting a fact that in academia, people do not really understand what a draft and what an RFC is. So the top concerns was again that these draft, and standardization in general, but we were IRTF, we don't do a standardization, but that drafts are poorly considered in academic circles. Well, b probably because people don't know what they are. The other point was that we needed to have more dissemination of the research group activities. A lot of people don't know we exist or have a very, they know maybe one research group exists, but they don't see how it fits, you know, with this whole ecosystem of, of you know, internet research. And there were the travel and the participation aspects. Well, it's, well, I'll go back actually, because the first thing that I think was very easy to, uh, to resolve on the, uh, even on the call was, was the travel, because you know, more and more there's people who are participating remotely to this, and if it's not for the 13 hours ahead or the 16 hours ahead or waking up at two in the morning to attend a meeting, uh, you can participate remotely and that won't cost you anything. So that was for me was moat. The, the other ones were much more important. So, writing a draft is not necessary to participate in the RG meeting. You know, we don't put, like, if you don't have a draft, you don't come in. It's not the case. Uh, we've had a number of uh, academic presentations, and I know, a, you know, a lot of other uh, research groups have had that. I think the uh, networking prizes and the workshops are exactly the right type of example of research that was done somewhere else that is actually now brought to this community. And we really welcome uh, grad student and postdoc. And again, I mentioned in our presentation that we participate in the hackathon, and I will be honest with you, when we participated in the hackathon in Montreal, was actually to, uh, to have a lot of the local uh, grad students uh, being able to come and see how it was going as a whole, because in the hackathon you have all the groups are there, and it was actually to enhance this participation from the local universities. 
And another thing is, again, I mentioned this uh, draft perception, kind of uneven, but if you think about it, um, mindsets are hard to change. Um, and some suggestions were that maybe we should state better the research challenges. I think a lot of times on our wikis, on the GitHub, and even on the charter, we're very, very focused on something we would like the group to achieve, but maybe not how it fits in the greater world of the research challenges for this field. Um, we could invite participation of people. Um, actually, I, I thanked Dave last time in Montreal. He had suggested a researcher in Chicago who had a fantastic presentation and was essentially had been invited for this. Um, Co-locate, actually people mentioned this, and co-locate interim meetings or even meetings during a conference that are related to the field and organize workshop. Um, and there's actually a great presentation from Lars uh, on bridging uh, the gap between internet standardization and networking that he presented in Brazil. Other ideas. Um, maybe create and then share uh, specific use cases and data on the wiki and, and basically create leverage, not just for one research group, but maybe link to what other research group are also doing so that people can start navigating through it. Um, add some research group topics in academic seminars and presentation. I will try that. We're doing ICN uh, 2020 in Montreal and we want to add uh, some presentations, some seminars, some workshops that go across a number of things and see how we can actually disseminate not just one research group ICN, but maybe also the, one, the other one I'm involved with, COIN, and network coding. And maybe we always say you can actually take your research and bring it into a draft. Well, why don't do the other way around? Also take some of the draft examples or the draft um, presentations or the draft writings and bring them into a, uh, a paper and Aaron has a question. Aaron Falk. Uh, Hi. Lots of good stuff here, Marie Jose. Uh, it's one, nice to meet you outside Cambridge, <laughs> 5,000 meals away. One, uh, one uh, idea that uh, I've seen that is not on here um, is something the NMRG implemented, which is that they did pre-publication reviews of papers and I think they needed some confidentiality to be able to do that, but um, there was, a, a, my understanding is that uh, the, uh, folks perceived that as being a real benefit and the papers improved. Good idea. Are you finished or? No, oh. there's three more slides and maybe my question will be, your question will I'll, be I'll answered. Wait. But yes. you know, please ask your question. If it's further, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> uh, well, I don't want to prevent you, you finishing, so. Um, uh, quick antidote, right? I actually was told recently uh, in a year that I had zero academic papers and a couple of RFCs that, you know, that wasn't good enough. And so I, I totally get that uh, that particular issue. And then this year, I actually have two really good academic papers and zero RFCs because the RFCs are taking that much longer and that much harder to get through the yeah. system. And I'm now going on like working group last call number three because people really care. And so I, I, you're absolutely right. I think one of the fundamental problems, though, is no matter how much of these other things you do, uh, the IETF and the IRTF are not listed on the academic, you know, grading scale of conferences from A to F. And, I, I and think how it's uneven. I think it's uneven. I, I think in in some circles it is well known, in others it's not. And it's, I think it's our it's our goal to to make it maybe gap, bridge that gap. Yeah, I want to actually other comment because in, in my case my. Supervisors absolutely know what the IETF is since ISI actually helped create it. So, you know, the knowledge of, of not understanding it isn't a problem. It's just from the academic, you know, grading perspective. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's interesting uh, the way different countries uh, evaluate the research. Um, you know, in, in, in some places, research impact is very heavily assessed, and, uh, you know, the, the, the IETF, IRTF activities uh, count for a lot more than in, in other regions. Alison Mankin, I'm uh, inspired by your bu bullet about vision or blue sky papers, um, and it struck me from some of my past time, like at NSF, that fields have 
uh, like 10-year horizon planning that they do a little bit formally, but that is very valuable for those fields in terms of getting funding. And maybe that's another way you could do this is, is have kind of informal review here in RGs free, but le lending itself to that kind of consensus about what big open directions are that could be helpful for the community, the academic community. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan Bogdanovich. So I'm looking at the second, you know, idea, invite participation in research groups and ideas from leading academics. Um, let's say I'm a regular ITF participant contributor. How can I know who are the leading, you know, participants? Usually how we know people come and volunteer. This is who we find out who is interested in the area that, you know, that we are doing some work. Yeah, but I think, I think, okay. Um, it's I'll a chicken and an egg problem. Well, I think I'll sound like uh, a social media guru here or some kind of influencer, but we all are at the center of, especially in this research world, we're all at the center of a large number of connections and we know who are the leaders in our, in our world and we can actually reach out to them. And if they cannot come, because, you know, for a reason they can, a lot of times people are really nice and they're going to suggest somebody else. So I, I think we should, we should not think that it, the world is limited to this room. You know, the world is is all around and connected a hundred ways. So um, I actually strongly believe that, you know, if we invite, you know, every time I've invited somebody in this environment, uh, even when they couldn't come, they actually suggested someone else. You wrote that line at the, big, at the bottom, Eve, so. Oh, about the vision and blue sky papers. Yeah, yeah, yes, that was it's, yours. It's because I keep seeing that conferences um, increasingly are including vision and blue sky papers and they are often invited papers. So, you know, it's in some ways like a free pass into a conference and it's super fun. Um, but I wanted to go back to the point about how do we get the academic community to change their perception that the RFCs aren't as or more important, you know, at least we want equal grounding, right? Or uh, we want people to be rewarded for it. And I wondered, um, whether in the same way that vision and blue sky papers are around fostering looking further ahead, and that's what the IRTF does, whether we can reach out to some of the communities like, and I'm from the US, so this is a US centric um, idea, but it translates to other geos. If we go to places, we have organizations like the NSF and like mm -hmm. DARPA and you know, the army has some lab, you know, they're, they're structures in place about what are the organizations, particularly government funded, that are looking at the challenges of connectivity and so forth, and having a seat at that table. And that's where the academics see that we have a seat at the table. Um, and, and so, and, and I think, uh, yeah. I, to, I, I think there is an example uh, of how this it, it works. Um, I'm old enough to have come to the IETF where it was really only US people. And I'm also a reviewer on the European uh, research projects, the, the big, well, now it's called H2020, but it was called it, all kinds of other things before. And at one point, somebody put in some of the outcomes and dissemination was participation in the internet, IETF. And suddenly, the rise of Europeans in the, in the IETF went that way. And I think maybe there's some similar thing that we could do in the IRTF to get more participation and my, dissemination. But my point was that we can certainly go out and ask others to come into our community. How do we go out and get invitations? Well, I think it's a two-way thing. Two right, so that was more the nature of my yeah. point and question. Uh, Christian Wittema, uh, about uh, the uh, RFC and evaluation, the RFC editor pushed a change in the RFC format a couple of years ago, I don't know whether you noticed, to have an OID reference mm -hmm. on every RFC, which was precisely to facilitate citations of RFCs in journals. And you can actually very easily count the citations of a given RFC on various uh, libraries. And I think that if we are concerned with that, then you can use these citations as a way to give weight to publications. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
Marko Kojo, an additional uh, note related to this. Uh, there is a very good paper published in ACM CCR by Brian Carpenter and uh, Greg Partridge that discusses the role of the RSCs as a scholar paper, starting from how to cite them. Thank you. Okay, um, so I, I'm getting out of... Oh, hi, Dirk. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Dirk Kutcher, just quickly. Um, I'm thinking that this presentation and also the discussion is um, suffering a little bit from what we actually criticized earlier, so projecting um, so known methods of working from the IETF to uh, IRTF research and then wondering, oh, why doesn't this work for academics? So I think you even mentioned uh, standardization on an earlier slide. I mean, this is really not what this is um, about. And um, so RSCs, um, I mean, that's an issue that, um, so we know that an, a, a standard strike RFC takes some time, but that's not what we are doing uh, mm -hmm. in, in the IRTF. And um, so I think what Dave mentioned earlier, that's really important um, that um, so there are at least two criteria to um, be aware of. So, say, some useful output for the IITF in, in some way, but also, I mean, doing really good, relevant, quality research. And if, you, if we are not able to do that, uh, no academic will find it interesting yeah, yeah, to, I know. to come to yeah. us. So, and, and for that, I think it could be interesting to um, discuss, say, certain indicators or say, models that seem to work well, and also maybe ask the question, I mean, what's the point of writing um, a draft or RSC? I mean, uh, there must be some, you know, some utility to that. And um, so what I think um, is really useful is see this as a means to enable experimentation. So to be able to, um, you know, take the, um, you know, academic <laughs> research, ivory tower things, and you know, keep people honest and uh, make things comparable and then try to gain some insights out of it. And this is where our model um, is useful. So mm -hmm. uh, writing up specs uh, in, in a sense and uh, looking at that. And um, so I would kind of maybe turn this around and then maybe ask what are good indicators and um, say good models that have worked well. Thank you. Um, Jan Iyengar, I'll be quick. Um, I agree that drafts have a use, but uh, you point out that IRT of draft perception in the academic world is uneven at best. I would argue that any draft perception in all worlds is uneven at best. Just to, uh, not to belabor the point, but even IIT of drafts are all over the place. Uh, you can have an independent submission, you can have uh, an informational RFC, you can have RFCs that have had review that haven't had as much review as we believe, and the IRTF is, is completely, you know, it's, it's much more, there's much more variance in, in IRTF drafts than there is in the IDF drafts. And in that sense, as an academic who's tried to, who's, who's gotten tenure based on, uh, uh, on publications, uh, I couldn't rely on, on RFCs, and yeah. that's just a fact of life. It's, it's not, I don't think it's reasonable to expect academics to, 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 to uh, for us to change the perception, because it's not a perception issue. Yeah, it is a real, it's a real issue in the sense that the, the goals of uh, what we do here tend to be different than the goals of what academic publications tend to be. And, and my question to you is, why, why is that the case? Because we want to foster good research. If you look at the papers that are always presented out of the, um, the networking prizes and everything. It's always top-notch stuff. So it, it, it makes no, um, you know, we're not doing second-rate stuff here. And I think that's, that's actually part of the perception. So maybe, uh, so the second point I was going to make might speak to what you're just, what you're just asking. I, <clears throat> I, I, want to, I, I want to disagree with the fact that we do research in the research groups. I'll disagree with this personally. I think we foster research. Well, I, I think that's an important I, distinction. It's fine, yes. I think okay. that's a very important distinction. And the distinction here is but that... Our, uh, but our participants do research. Well, so, so I'll give you an example, right? In ICCRG, I think we foster research. What that means is there are groups that go off, do research, publish, come here and present what they've done. Yep. And uh, they'll keep coming back and doing stuff. They don't use us as a publication venue. 
we as a research group aren't publishing one thing, mm -hmm. but we are engaging with various entities, various groups, students, mm -hmm. uh, industry groups that are publishing on their own, but we are creating an environment where they all come, talk, and we have a forum for that to happen. So as a research group, I think we foster research. I don't think we are a publication venue, but I think we should be clear about the fact that we are allowing and encouraging and, and uh, 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 making the research happen, but uh, the metrics shouldn't be publication. Hi, Dave. I, I want to go beyond and emphasize, I think, even more strongly what Jana was, was getting at. I mean, I do research. I run an, an RG, I participate in RG. If I have some super great idea, I'm not gonna take it to an RG. I'm gonna write a paper and I'm gonna get it through uh, a double blind program committee and convince people that this is, this is super novel and uh, something that's gonna change the world. What RGs are, I think, going to be most successful doing is this collaboration function, right? Which is because academics I got to tell you, they don't collaborate very well with each other. They're forced, they're forced to by their funding agencies, and if they weren't forced to, they wouldn't do it. Um, they, you know. So uh, uh, Eve's here, and she, uh, she may want to comment on this. We have a really good joint project uh, between NSF and Intel that talks about wireless edge computing and ICN. Yep. We have been, I think we have a absolutely perfect zero record of getting anybody who was doing research under that project to come and present it at, at either ICNRG or any of the wireless uh, oriented research groups. And the reason for that is that it's, it's an extra, it's extra work for no particular benefit in those contexts. So for me, I think we have to push this, this collaboration and community aspect of the function of the IRTF um, and, and make our case based on that as opposed to we're doing great research in the IRTF. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah, I, I was always thinking was that we, it's not that we do good research. I think our partner is good research. So I'm, thank you for, for correcting this. Yes, Eve. Yeah, uh, out of time, I'm afraid, Eve. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, I switched a few things. I, I skipped a few things, so I can I can see that obviously we can do better. I really like the idea of the fostering. I really like the idea of the, commu the communities. And actually, uh, I'm going to conclude with something that I said this morning, my first presentation at 7.30. Uh, what we want to create in is Agora for people to come and share and, you know, essentially have the rest of the community understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how we can create even more research. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you uh, again to uh, Wei Tang for the ANRP presentation. Thank you to everybody who spoke later. I think that's been a really interesting discussion. Um, hopefully we can uh, continue this discussion throughout the rest of the week. Uh, thank you, everybody. And if you have the blue sheets, please pass them to the front. <laughs>